be considered synthetic biology. Uh, so this first one is a glowing plant. So this was kind of hit a bunch of news a couple of years ago. There was a Kickstarter campaign where a bunch of people wanted to take uh, this green fluorescent protein, or GFP, which is naturally found in a jellyfish. It's essentially a protein that makes things fluorescent. And they wanted to put it in a plant so that you would, you know, have a plant in your room. If you turned off the lights and shine some blue light, you have a little fluorescent plant. So the real real utility of this isn't particularly fast, but it's kind of a cool project. Kind of for something that's a little bit more useful, you may have heard of this uh, golden rice. So this is the idea of taking uh, a set of genes that would encode um, uh, proteins that can make vitamin A and put that into rice. So uh, vitamin A deficiency in terms of malnourishment is one of the major issues uh, that people in the third world face when it comes to famine. So the idea was could you augment the natural properties of rice, the nutritional properties of rice to further supplement the diet uh, of people that are eating rice with vitamin A. So this is kind of more, I would say, a useful application of synthetic biology. But it's still quite simple, just kind of taking a couple of genes that encode vitamin A, putting them into the rice. Uh, where I think synthetic biology and kind of the field of engineering really uh, comes to shine is when you're looking for more complex phenotypes. So this is kind of one of the, the seminal papers in Symbio. It was out of Jay Kiesman's lab at UC Berkeley. And the idea was that they were taking yeast, so baker's yeast that you might use to make bread, and they were putting in a set of genes so that these yeasts can make an anti-malarial drug called artemisinin. So this in entailed kind of rewiring the metabolism of the cells so that they were able to make sugar and make these precursors for these anti-malarial drugs. Um, and this doesn't just stop at anti-malarials. There's tons of people all over the world very interested in engineering either bacteria or yeast or other sorts of microorganisms uh, to make other chemicals that would have value. Some of them might have clinical value, like anti-malarials or opioids or stuff of the sort. But there are also ones, things like amino acids, other dietary supplements that people are making with living cells. And then the last example that I was going to give is one that I find very interesting. It's called CAR T cell, CAR -T -cell therapy. And the basic idea is that uh, patients, particularly those that have uh, blood borne cancer, so things like leukemia or lymphomas, they would go into the clinic uh, clinicians would extract a set of immune cells from their blood called T cells. They would bring them into the lab and then genetic engineers would add receptors to these T cells to kind of teach the cells to recognize the cancers that the patient has. And then they would take those cells, re-inject them back into the patient, and the, the T cells that have been engineered can specifically remove those tumors. So this is kind of a very new, as you can imagine, therapy, kind of engineering your own immune system in the lab and re-implanting in the body but for, particularly for things like leukemia and lymphomas, it has over a 90% cure rate. And there's a lot of uh, kind of active research in the field of how this could be adapted to solid tumors, how you can reduce off-target effects. And I think this is kind of one of the most exciting and closest prospects of synthetic biology in terms of uh, clinical applications. Um, so in terms of synthetic biology, we really like to think of it as an engineering discipline. So you might like to think, so if you think of electrical engineering as folks that are interested in kind of tinkering with circuits or chemical engineering, interested in uh, producing chemicals at scale, but bioengineering is really engineering biology and using biological systems to solve real world problems. So what biological engineers use as kind of the fundamental unit, for the most part, is DNA. So what we're really doing is taking DNA, either synthetic DNA, taking DNA from different organisms, modifying it, and um, using that as the building blocks. So each of these different pieces of DNA might come uh, for different elements. So there might be uh, regulatory elements that, or so there might be genes, so these genes put in a protein, and these particular proteins might have some sort of effect. And then there are other regulatory elements that control whether or not these genes are uh, on or off or whether or not they are, they're expressed. So there's uh, things like promoters, ribosome binding sites, different transcription factors that can turn on and off gene expression. And then finally in the right, you might get this complicated circuit that, uh, that has multiple different proteins, multiple different regulatory elements, and that has uh, so that the cells can perform a sort of sophisticated function. So normally what we do is we have an idea of a project, something uh, that, uh, of, uh, that we would want a cell to perform. We would figure out what sort of genetic parts would be necessary in order for these cells to perform it. Then we find the DNA uh, that can encode these, and we usually do this uh, in the computer. Then the next step is really to build it. 
So there's a bunch of different molecular biology techniques, so things like Gibson or Golden Gate, uh, but essentially the idea is, uh, or you can order it from the vendor, is you take this idea that you have in the computer and you translate it into a physical piece of DNA that you might have in the lab. And then you would take that DNA, introduce it into a living cell, and then test whether or not that cell is performing the function. And the whole uh, engineering idea is that once you do these tests, you might learn what, what works, what doesn't work. You could redesign uh, the gene circuits so that they can perform better. And you can go through this iterative cycle of finally creating a living cell that can perform a function. And to break it down uh, into this really cellular computing, especially in the flavor of creating cells uh, for clinical applications, uh, you can think of it in three different sort of modules. So you would have the cell, and the cell would uh, sense different things in its environment. So in the case of disease, it might be different biomarkers of disease, but it really could be any sort of input that the cell would take in and use to make different decisions. Once it takes in those inputs, it integrates them uh, in some sort of way uh, to perform logic for decision making. So you might think that if there's a cell, it would only want to produce something when it's at high temperature, or say there's, uh, you know, if it's in the gut, maybe there's blood in the gut, so it would want to produce a therapeutic uh, to kind of get, uh, get rid of whatever pathology, whatever pathology might be there. Uh, the idea is that it can integrate a bunch of these different inputs and then finally make a decision to produce an output, which in the context of therapy would be some sort of therapeutic output. It could be a drug. And again, in the context of therapy, you can think that this drug could then treat the disease there might be different, uh, you might reduce the inputs that would cause the production of the drug. So we would call this a closed loop system. So the cells are kind of smart. They would sense whether or not a disease is present. They can produce a drug to resolve that disease. And then once the, the disease is away, they can turn themselves off until it arises again. So I was gonna stop now uh, to see if anyone, had, uh, anyone has any questions. Uh, if not, I kind of move on to the, to the next part. So what, what kind of level of complexity do you get to involving the system? So I mean, an electrical engineering circuit is like very constrained, right? You have very fine control of inputs yep. and outputs, but you know, cell is like this, you know, like the nucleus and cytoplasm, these horrible chambers of global variables, right? There's sort of this shared state of facts. Um, so, so what's, do you have any thing of like how complicated you can, you know, make these, you know, design, like, are you, are you able to do these, like, maybe two-level interactions, or, like, how? Yeah, so, it, it some of, yeah, so I, as you alluded to, um, I guess in electrical systems, things are pretty well-defined. They're very much on and off. If you, if yeah. you look at a transistor and the performance, the, right. it's a very sharp digital curve. Once it reaches a voltage threshold, it either turns on and off. Yeah. In biological systems, as you might imagine, the world is very noisy and cells are responding to different things. Uh, so those nice uh, input-output curves that you have aren't particularly sharp, they're a little bit noisy. Um, there are a lot of people that are interested in modeling these systems, so uh, bringing in different kinetic or stochastic models to kind of understand and better program how the cells are working. And there's also a lot of people that are interested in making better genetic parts so that you would have a more defined control. Uh, I think the record now is something around 52 different genetic parts uh, in, in uh, kind of all put together. There was um, a group at MIT, Chris Voigt's lab, is interested in uh, re recreating the, the sort of circuits that were used in uh, whatever the Apollo was that yeah. sent to people to the moon. Uh, they got halfway there. So oh, wow. in terms of complexity, it's kind of approaching that of electrical systems, but in general, the, the, the cells have different benefits as compared to, um, you would never use a cell to kind of engineer an iPhone, but you might use it to engineer a therapeutic, or there might be other sorts of applications where living cell computing is cool. Awesome, if there's any other questions? No. Actually, I will start from this question. Your cellular computer represents a cell as a living unit. Mm. All cells that are interactive and they depend on the environment. Mm. They will, I just want to know, are you going to talk about interactivity as well? Or do you going to focus on, on this single cell that will have all necessary mechanisms yeah. to get to some products or outcomes? Yeah, so um, 
Yeah, so I guess it, most people are kind of concerned about engineering particular cells themselves. I guess it's a nice segue into the next section. But um, I think that uh, depending on the application, if you're thinking, you're, you know, you're growing a bad yeast to make this anti-malarial drug, it's kind of a closed system. It doesn't need to be that complex. But if you're engineering cells that are going to interact with the human body, there's obviously a bunch of different environmental inputs that might come into that. There's the host itself, the body that would be interacting with these cells. So all those things would need to be uh, taken into account. And that kind of segues into kind of my personal interests, which um, is within this field of synthetic biology, but really intersects with the microbiota or the microbiome, or you might uh, think of it as the gut biome um, itself. So uh, as probably many of you know now, the human body is colonized uh, with um, a bunch of different microbes. So any sort of exposed surface on the human body, so this is the skin, kind of the, the nasal passages, the respiratory tract, the gastrointestinal tract, uh, all these different uh, places on the body have their own microbiome or kind of a collection of microbes that live on them. So and these can consist of bacteria, different fungi, protists, uh, different worms in uh, different parts of the world. And all of these are highly related to human health. Uh, there are some numbers that people like throwing up there about the importance of this, and that's like you have an equal number of bacterial cells in your body as you do human cells, and you have around 100 times more genes that are encoded within your microbiome as compared uh, to your own genome. So it's all well and good that there's kind of bacteria that live on and in our body, but uh, what we're really interested about it is that it's very well understood now that the microbiota is perturbed in disease. So uh, people that have a variety of different diseases, which I'll just throw up here, have a different sort of microbiota as compared to healthy people. So this could range anywhere from cancer to different infections to diseases of metabolism like diabetes or obesity, different sorts of immune diseases, uh, like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, and even different sorts of neurological diseases like autism or Parkinson's disease. So uh, in the recent years, there's been kind of this deluge of studies showing that the, the bacteria or the fungi that live within a people's bodies are indicative of all these different diseases and also impact their pathology. Um, from the perspective of engineering though, what I find really interesting is that since the, the bugs that kind of live within us are so well connected to all these different physiological processes, you can think that if you can engineer the microbiome or control in a precise manner the bacteria that live within the body, you might be able to affect all of these different diseases. Um, one of the challenges though is that there really aren't a lot of techniques in order to do that. So it's, a, it's a very well defined to kind of establish these correlations. You know, you might have a healthy person or a diseased person, use a variety of assays to look at what sort of bacteria live in their body, and you can see that there are differences. But to kind of boil those differences down into either particular bacteria or particular pathways or particular molecules that might be perturbed in disease that you can then turn into drugs is still a challenge. So here comes in this kind of intersection between the microbiome and synthetic biology, which we call microbiome engineering. So kind of taking these genetic engineering approaches that you might use to engineer cells and apply these in the case of the microbiome. And there are a couple different examples of uh, microbiome engineering, um, kind of different categories that I like to put them in. So the first of which is uh, these sort of additive therapies. So simply put, this is adding something new to the microbiome. So you have a bunch of bacteria that live within the body, you want to add something new to that. So there are a couple of things that you might be familiar with that are currently on the market right now, and these are probiotics. So this might be you know, the yogurts that you eat, the kombucha that you drink, or you can buy some probiotics off the shelf or right now. Um, and by taking these, you'll ingest these, they might colonize the gut, and they'll affect your health. Um, the second one are these FMTs, or fecal microbiota transplants which are kind of this uh, slightly odd therapy that is uh, uh, gaining more prominence in the field. And essentially what you do is you take fecal matter from a healthy individual and you would transplant that into a diseased individual. And even though this is kind of odd, it sees remarkable efficacy, particularly for recurring clostridium difficile infections, as well as several other gastrointestinal infections, and also for inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease and also colitis. Um, so these are kind of current therapies, and moving forward, what we're really interested in the field of microbiome engineering 
is, in the terms of probiotics, is using these engineered microbes, so augmenting the natural properties of uh, probiotics that you might find in these, uh, in these fermented foods so that they can produce drugs on demand or uh, kind of uh, help human health in a more productive way. And uh, similarly, on the side of fecal microbiota transplants, instead of taking raw stool that you might isolate from a patient, there are lots of groups that are interested in kind of figuring out the exact microbes that are responsible for curing the disease and kind of culturing those in isolation and putting those together so you can have these designer consortia that you would give to different patients. So that's the first field of micro, uh, my, microbiome engineering. The second of which are these subtractive therapies. So the idea is that you're removing specific bacteria from the microbiome. So in terms of things that are on the market, you might think of antibiotics, the sort of ampicillins or superfloxacins that you might get when you go to your PCP. And the idea is that you're removing either single or in most cases right now, multiple different strains from the microbiome. The issue with kind of the current antibiotic therapies is they really act as a sledgehammer. They don't kind of remove the specific bacteria that you want to remove. They really remove the huge swaths of the different microbes in the microbiome. So moving forward in the field, we're really interested in these very targeted therapies uh, that are a much narrower in spectrum so that we can selectively remove uh, particular microbes. So uh, something that uh, myself, as well as the Lou Lab in general, works on are these uh, things that are called bacteriophages. So these are viruses that infect bacteria. So they have these cool little moon lander-like shapes uh, that are depicted here in this cartoon. And as, compa as compared to traditional antibiotics that you might get now at the clinic, they're much narrower in spectrum. So here you have this orange phage that's selectively removing uh, these orange bacteria from the microbiome without harming any of the bystanders. Um, and this isn't really a new thing, so it was discovered over a century ago um, these sort of bacteriophages, and long before uh, people were thinking about using conventional antibiotics as therapies, people were working on these bacteriophages or phages to use as, as uh, therapies in the clinic. In the Western world, mostly because antibiotics worked so well, they kind of fell out of fashion, but particularly in the Soviet countries, uh, kind of during the 50s to the 2000s, uh, people are continually using bacteriophages. If you go to Georgia or Russia, there are some uh, doctors there that would prescribe uh, phages in the, uh, as a form of therapy. Um, one of the advantages, too, of uh, bacteriophages is there's kind of a phage for each bacteria. You can readily isolate them from the environment so that you can get these selective antimicrobials quite readily. And then combined with synthetic biology, you can think of, again, augmenting the natural properties of these phages. So this might be through the addition of different proteins onto the phages that is so that they can better kill the bacteria that they're going to kill by changing different components so that they can target different bacteria, um, as well as ch changing their capsid or other structural components so that they're more stable in the body or that they're more, um, or that they have altered affinity to mucus. So that's it for this subtractive therapy. For the last of which, in terms of these microbiome engineering strategies, kind of has nothing to do with synthetic biology or anything like that, are these sorts of uh, prebiotics. So here, I have this nice piece of bread and an apple, but the general idea is that uh, these are foods or um, sort of abiotic, non-living entities that you might ingest, and this might either enrich or deplete or at least change the activity of uh, bacteria or other organisms that live within the body. So this is my little spiel about uh, microbiome engineering. So if you have any questions kind of, of how synthetic biology and the microbiome intersect, I'd be happy to take them now. If not, I'll talk about a specific project in a little bit more detail. I guess you're, you're working with bacterial pages in particular, so it's, it's quite easy for you to maybe you know, sequence and see the effects. But for you know, there's there's some of the like from I think the slide you showed diseases, right? Yeah. Um, the some of those can have quite complex communities. Yep. And so how do you or the, the impression I get from a lot of microbial sort of sequencing is the field is still like very young and it's, it's very hard to like get a good sense, a good picture of the diversity of the population. Yeah. Like so is that Yeah, I, I, would, I would say the um, the sequencing studies are very good at establishing these correlations and they're also very good for hypothesis. 
So you might get a list of microbes that are either enriched or depleted in a particular disease, and then you might think, oh, maybe we should put these guys back in, or maybe we should try to get these guys out. Um, some of the, a lot of the issue is in terms of getting these guys out, there's kind of a lack of these target antimicrobials, so it's hard to actually remove those. And to put these guys in, maybe you can do that if you culture them, but kind of moving down the line, people are interested in finding the particular proteins or the particular small molecules that, the, that these bacteria are producing and how they might affect the cells. And then that's really where sort of in genetic engineering and synthetic biology fall in where you can actually do these sorts of studies. Uh, otherwise, you just have microbes that you isolate from the, from the environment and it's really hard to figure out exactly what genes are responsible if you're not able to tap into modifying the genetics. Yeah. So if you're, so if you're trying to search for strains of, uh, of bacteria to target with your sub sub subtractive therapy, mm -hmm. Like, how easy is it for to find all players in the system? Uh, yeah, so I think for, um, right now with sequencing, it's a pretty good, you, you okay, can so you generally find... get those, the, the, the general idea of what to do. Um, and then I think you would use that to power studies to kind of remove uh, suspect microbes and then figure out how they would affect the system. Maybe they don't, maybe that's kind of a bystander effect and there's actually another player that's the one that's really responsible. But you kind of need those techniques in order to probe the system. Um, how long does the um, phase treatment you know, need to go for it to work? Does it do for it to have to be the effect? Yeah, so, it's, so in terms of phage in, uh, in the clinic, there's uh, especially for well done clinical trials, there's kind of a lot of case reports and stuff like that uh, showing that it works, but there hasn't been a very strong clinical trial showing exactly what those sort of genetics would be like. Um, I've seen some case reports that it's like very quick. There's some remarkable things where you see someone with a diabetic foot ulcer, they have this really nasty infection, you know, none of the antibiotics that are available are working, and you can use, especially at least in the United States, you can use phage as a last resort. And within days, you can see the wound heal up. So uh, when it works, it seems like it works very well. Uh, but it's still very early days in kind of getting a clinical understanding of how well it works and how generalizable that might be in the So just the Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to, <clears throat> to add to the thing that you just explained to the audience. This topic is becoming very popular, actually, in many labs actually working on this. And I never would think that that implantation of a healthy person become material is making such a big difference. Yeah. And I was visiting some clinics during the summer, as you mentioned, in some European or post-Soviet countries. Mm -hmm. And they are working on that. It's a real life scenario. Yeah. At the beginning, it was kind of a surprising thing to me. But I think using microbiome engineering strategies and having simplified microorganisms and trying to find their environment and their interaction with organism as human, mm. I think it's really very amazing field to start with and then to look into more complicated diseases or therapies in the future. Yeah. I just want to say you know, how important it is to start from our gut. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so I'll go into the last part. I might skip over uh, uh, some of the more nitty-gritty data, but I at least want to kind of go over, or at least use this project as an example of really what could be done with synthetic biology um, and how it might pertain to different biomedical applications. So this is particularly focusing on the, the, the sensor part of this additive strategy. So the idea of using living cells to sense different molecules in the environment and using uh, the cells themselves as a way of diagnosing whether or not, whether or not these particular uh, molecules are there. So in general, um, the, the whole field really of these, what we call whole cell biosensors, so these are these living cells that can sense their environment, is predicated on the idea that living cells all constantly alter their gene expression to adapt to a changing environment. So you might imagine that there could be a little bacteria that's living in your glass of water, um, and when you ingest that water, now it's going into your stomach, which is a very acidic environment. 
So what the bacteria will do is that it'll change the genes that they're expressing to create a bunch of proteins so that they can be more acid tolerant, so that maybe they can make it further down in the body where they can survive. Uh, the idea is kind of taking advantage of this natural property of cells to sense their environment to create new sorts of diagnostics. So here, this kind of depicted what this looks like molecularly. So you have these little you know, ovals or hexagons that are different analytes that you might want to sense. And there are different proteins that are within the cells that are either uh, receptors that are kind of at the surface of the cells or different uh, proteins or transcription factors that are floating around in the cytoplasm that could bind to these particular analytes and then change expression of genes in the cell. For this particular example, it's this gene called LUX, which encodes a protein called the luciferase, which essentially produces light. So simply put, this is we're engineering these cells in this context, if they sense a target molecule in their environment, they produce light in response to that. And there are a number of advantages of why you might want to use these whole cell biosensors as opposed to more conventional sorts of, uh, of sensors. So the first of which is that cells are living, they're always living, they're always interrogating our environment. So they can do continuous sensing. So say in the context of the gut, you can envision having a microorganism that is always living in the gut and is uh, constantly sensing whether or not a particular molecule is there. And if that molecule arrives, they can change their gene expression, maybe they can produce light, maybe they can produce some sort of pigment, they'll produce some sort of response, and, um, and then you'll know whether or not that molecule is there. That is kind of in contrast to other sorts of more traditional methods where you would need to constantly sample the environment and you only get periodic glimpses of what's going on. The second of which is that living cells are relatively robust. So in this particular system that we have here, the, the proteins, the receptors, the transcription factors are the real sensors. Those are the things that are really binding to the molecules and seeing to whether or not they're there. And the cell itself kind of acts as this protective bag. It buffers against different changes in, in temperature, different changes in acidity or salinity, um, and generally makes it a lot more stable across a wide variety of environments. So if you're thinking of harsh environments, things like the gut, maybe things like the ocean, uh, environments where it's very difficult uh, for a more traditional tests to work, living cells might offer some advantage. And the last of which is that all living systems are evolved, which is in terms of synthetic biology, very helpful because essentially you can take a sensor, which isn't very good, and through the process of evolution, you can really evolve it to make it a more optimized sensor. And that's a lot easier than using a lot of other sort of chemical tests where you can tap into this natural process of evolution. However, one of the major limitations of using these living cell sensors, especially in the, con in the context of biomedical applications, is readout. So it's all fine and dandy that you know these bacteria are changing their gene expression and producing light, but how can you really detect that light if it's within the body? Uh, or, or are you going to kind of break open the cells, analyze their DNA, that's a lot of work, how can you make that more track? So to kind of address this, we uh, paired up with a team at MIT, so particularly Philip Nadeau, who's a, a grad student in the Chandrakasin's lab, and in this lab, they're real specialists in more traditional electrical engineering. So they make these CMOS integrated circuits, the type of things that you might normally see in your laptop computer or your phones. And essentially, Phil was interested in taking these sorts of more traditional electronic circuits and applying it to, uh, to biomedical applications and kind of combining it with synthetic biology as well. So we kind of, we, we cooked up this little project. Uh, that was a two-part project that we like to think of as the best of both, both worlds. So on my side, I was engineering uh, probiotic bacteria to sense different biomarkers uh, of disease that might exist in the gut. And in response to those, they would produce light. So up top, there's a little capsule kind of depicted. So here you have the little green bacteria that are glowing that are confined within wells of these particular capsules. So they're separated from the outside world by a semi-permeable membrane that allows uh, different biomarkers to diffuse into the wells so the bacteria can detect them, but there are pores in the membrane that, pre that prevent the bacteria from escaping the device. On Phil's side, what he was essentially designing was a miniaturized luminometer. So this, these electronic circuits that can detect the low levels of light being produced by the bacteria and then wirelessly transmit that outside the body. And what in the end we essentially created was this ingestible medical device that combined these living cells that were performing the sensing and then these electronic readout circuits. So what we would envision is this capsule and a patient would ingest the capsule and as it's transiting down the gastrointestinal tract, 
uh, the bacteria can uh, sense different biomarkers that might be associated with disease. And then in response to that, they would produce light, and the electronic readout circuits that are underneath each well can detect that light and report that wirelessly to a phone outside of the body. So as you might imagine, this is kind of a um, somewhat futuristic high-risk project. Uh, Anatha and uh, my boss, Tim, were kind of very skeptical that we can get it to work at the beginning, uh, but we nonetheless uh, persevered. So to start off with, we needed to engineer these probiotics to sense some sort of clinically relevant biomarkers. So we thought we'd go, as a proof of concept, a pretty low-hanging fruit to see whether or not we can sense blood in the gut. As you might imagine, no one would probably want any blood in their gastrointestinal tract, and in terms of animal models, it was relatively easy to get those set up. So on at least my side, we started uh, engineering these bacteria to sense blood. So I did this though, with the help of an undergrad from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, Sean Kareem, uh, who was kind of really instrumental in getting this project off the ground. Uh, what we essentially did was we looked in the literature for a transcription factor or a protein that can bind to heme, which is a major component of blood. So we found uh, this, uh, this protein called HRTR that was from a distant organism, actually a dairy-producing organism called Lactococcus lactis, and we took that protein and then we put it into E. coli. The problem was that since these two organisms were so different, we needed to rewire some of the regulatory systems so that this protein can kind of be compatible with this distantly related E. coli. So in order to do that, we made uh, the synthetic promoter, which is described, uh, which kind of is depicted here, where we took different elements from the native organism as well as elements from E. coli and put them together. And downstream of that, we have this Lux cassette, which is the luciferase that will produce light when it's expressed. Kind of the, one of the problems is that the heme can actually penetrate or get into the cell, into an E. coli cell, because it has this dual membrane structure as opposed to the native Lactococcus lactis, which only has one membrane. So to get around that, we put this additional transporter, this protein called CHU-A, which would allow heme to go into the cell. So to kind of go over that with a little bit of data, uh, in these engineered cells, if you have these E. coli that are always producing this Lux gene, you can see that they always have high levels of luminescence, so de depicted by the teal line there. If you have this uh, protein HRTR, which would turn off the gene expression, you can see that you can lower that, um, but it is unresponsive to heme. So regardless of how much heme we add to the culture, you don't get any change in luminescence. But if you add this a third protein, this CHU-A protein, that allows heme to go into the cell, you can get increasing amounts of luminescence with, um, with increasing amounts of heme. So this was kind of like our first experiment. We were very excited about that. And we went through a bunch of different iterations that I won't go into to kind of improve the performance of the circuit. So what, what we started with was that black line there um, that, that you can see is not very good. After going through all the optimization, we got the blue line in this laboratory strain of E. coli, which is a lot more sensitive and has a much a greater on-to-off ratio of, um, in the absence or in the presence of blood. And then finally, we transferred it into the yellow line, which is this nissel strain. So this is a probiotic strain of E. coli, which could be found over the counter with Zinofluor. And this is the strain that we used for the majority of the studies. So we um, wanted to test out whether or not these blood sensor bacteria can actually perform as they should within a model. So that data that I showed you before was in a very well-controlled test tube. We wanted to see whether it would work in a mouse. In a mouse. So we used this model uh, that's based on indomethacin, which is an NSAID, like Advil or ibuprofen. When it's given at high doses, this can lead to ulcers in the upper gastrointestinal tract, either in the stomach or in the upper small bowel, and this leads to bleeding uh, throughout the gut. So in this particular model, we gavage the mice with indomethacin. Then the next morning, we gavage them with the the blood or microbiology force feed the mice with these um, uh, blood sensor bacteria. And then six hours after that, we collect their fecal pellets and we see how much uh, luminescence or light we can detect in the, in the pellets and also how many bacteria made it through the mice. And you can see by this uh, data here that in the mice that were treated with indomethacin and had blood in their stool, you can see higher amounts of light that you can detect uh, from the mice as opposed to mice that had been treated with buffer alone. So this was great. We saw that the blood sensor bacteria can work within the gut of the mice. So kind of meanwhile, at the same time, Phil was working hard on creating this ingestible capsule. So you can see it, uh, the, the physical capsule depicted in the lower left there, 
Um, it is uh, relatively large. It's about one by th uh, three centimeters, which is kind of at the upper bounds of what might be adjustable by a human. So obviously, if we're moving into the clinic, we're going to want to shrink it a little bit. Uh, but there's uh, two major parts. So there you can see the green circuit board that uh, Phil designed that uh, contains a variety of different elements. So I'll just point it a little bit here. So it has these four photo detectors that the bacteria sit on top of. And there's uh, four of them. One of them acts as a kind of a channel to uh, calibrate for background measurements. And then the other three can act as different channels. So you can have different strains of bacteria that, are sense, that can sense different biomarkers so that you can simultaneously sense different bio, uh, three different biomarkers at the same time. There's a variety of other electrical components that can kind of take the, the photo current that is taken off the detectors, process it in such a way, send that to a radio that's on the, trip, uh, on the chip, and then that can wirelessly report uh, findings outside of the body. So when combining the blood sensor bacteria with this electronic chip, we uh, loaded up the device and we submerged it in a fluid that uh, either contained uh, no blood or 500 parts per million of blood. And you can see that within 30 to 45 minutes, we can, we can detect blood uh, within the device. And then if you submerge this device into fluid that contains different concentrations of blood, you can get different levels of current, so you can get a sort of quantitative readout of, um, uh, of blood detection. Uh, I also wanted to note, maybe I won't go into all the details, that it's really a modular system. So any sort of bacteria that you might design to sense different sorts of molecules can be easily integrated into the system um, without much effort. So we took these two different sensors that existed in the field. Uh, one is detecting this molecule called a AHL, which is kind of a signature of bacteria. Uh, that bacteria normally secrete, and the other one is this molecule called thiosulfate, which is indicative of inflammation. So we hooked up this Lux cassette uh, downstream of these particular systems, and you can see with increasing amounts of AHL or thiosulfate, you get increasing amounts of luminescence, and then we were able to easily incorporate it into the device so that you could have uh, this uh, hybrid electronic and uh, living cell device that can sense either blood, AHL, or thiosulfate. So finally, just to end off, we wanted to demonstrate that this entire system, so both the sensor bacteria in, in conjunction with these electronic readout circuits, uh, could work in uh, a living organism. So in order to do that, we used a, a pig model with the help of Dr. Giovanni Traverso, who's a gastroenterologist at uh, Harvard Medical School and Brigham Women's Hospital. So we used a pig model of gastric bleeding. Uh, where we took the anesthet anesthetized animals, so they were asleep. Um, we administered a bicarbonate glucose solution that was spiked with blood. So the bicarbonate was included to neutralize some of the stomach acid to kind of keep the cells a little bit happier while they're performing their sensing in the body. And then we would take the capsule that was loaded up with blood sensor bacteria and deposit that into the stomach uh, via an endoscopic overtube. And then over the course of two hours, we would measure whether or not the bacteria within the device are detecting the blood that was in the stomach. There's just uh, two images here. So uh, the top is an endoscopic image showing the, the, the capsule within the, the pig's stomach. It's kind of half submerged in the gastric fluid. And on the bottom, you can see an x-ray image. And it's kind of small, but depicted by the arrow, you can see this uh, little electronic device within the stomach of the pig. And long story short, after a lot of optimization, it worked uh, quite well. So if uh, you deposit this, the, the capsule of blood sensor bacteria into the gut of pigs, you can see a signal somewhere between 45 and 60 minutes. And that signal grows and separates over time. And then on the bottom, this is a curve that kind of uh, depict the, the quality of the test. Um, and suffice it to say that if you take the longer time that you, um, that you use to uh, to, to perform the measurement, the uh, higher amount of discrimination you can get between the groups. And at uh, 120 minutes or two hours, you can perfectly discriminate between pigs that have blood in their stomach as uh, compared to pigs that don't. So this is the ingestible capsule project. Um, some conclusions that I'll just glaze over and some acknowledgments of a, a variety of the people that helped out with the project as well as the funding sources. And that's it for the talk. I'll take any questions. Uh, either on synthetic biology in general, uh, microbiome engineering, this particular project at the end. And if you have any um, questions about sort of the ethical implications of some of the stuff that I was talking about today, I think it'd be great if we could have a discussion. So, thank you. Sure. 
So I'd say the first one that would probably immediately come to mind is GMOs, or genetically modified organisms. I think, um, depending on the groups of people, it could be um, a dirty word, so that people don't, uh, a lot of people like avoiding genetically modified organisms, they wouldn't like ingesting them, and there are a lot of concerns that um, kind of surround that. And obviously, since the, the entire field is predicated on genetic engineering, you can't really get around the fact that we're engineering these organisms and that there might be long-term effects that we don't particularly know about releasing these organisms to the environment, how they might affect health. And there's constant conversations in the community about how you can better understand uh, what, these, what these risks would be and um, different strategies that you can put in to mitigate. Um, so there's, along with that, I guess, as the genetic engineering is becoming more and more sophisticated and as we get more control about how we can engineer the cells, there's a lot of groups that are very interested in engineering safeguards into those cells to limit the release into their environment so that they don't, uh, you know, produce their therapeutic payloads when they shouldn't be or so that if they get into the wrong place that they're not doing those sorts of things. Um, I can kind of go into some of those examples if, if you're interested. Uh, but that is something that I think the field is very cognizant of, and as the field has developed over time, it is something that uh, people are very concerned about of how you can safeguard these technologies and make sure that you know, they don't fall into the wrong hands or they don't cause any potential harm. Is there any like like difference between probiotics on the market or how do you know like what type would be right or is there any is it just kind of um, like yeah so I'd say the, um, the the probiotics that are on the market right now I think across the board are dairy organisms so they're you know organisms that were used to make yogurt or cheese and now they're cultured in vats and distilled down into a pill form um, there's a lot of data that's showing consum uh, that consumption of these fermented food products um, has health benefits, but you can also imagine that there might be a lot better organisms than just kind of these things that were lying around because they're left over from cheese production. So um, in terms of the field of making these new probiotics, there's um, some companies in, 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 up in Boston, like uh, Series Health is one of the big ones, Finch Therapeutics is another big one, uh, they're interested in taking uh, these data sets that are available for the fecal microbiota transplants that I was talking about and culturing these organisms and then using those as what they like to call next generation probiotics. So instead of just using these dairy organisms, we, there might be some weird organisms that people don't really understand, but they might be better at protecting against different diseases than just, you know, that thing that we got off cheese. It seems your capsule um, is for short term because the bacteria in the, in the capsule have to divide mm. and, and then there, there may be a limited amount of nutrients um, that, that would support them. Mm. So how long do you think that the capsule will last? So I can say with confidence in the animal studies, we did two hours and they were still alive then. Um, for mouse studies and stuff like that that I've done, the bacteria live for weeks within the mouse. In the capsule? Uh, not within the capsule, without the capsule. And I guess within the capsule, the idea would be that they could tap into the nutrients that are available within the gut to help support the growth of the, of, of the organisms. Um, I'll also say that based on some uh, data that's a startup out of Boston uh, called Synlogix, uh, what they're creating this therapeutic organism that can produce some proteins uh, in the gut as they're transmitting through. And they characterize that, at least uh, even in humans, that as they're transiting through the gut of these, uh, they're able to use the available nutrients in order to support both their growth as well as the production of uh, the drugs that they want. So I would at least expect within the capsule that the nutrients available would be able to support. If not, you can think of kind of packaging some other nutrients within the capsule. Right. Yeah. Are uh, these In this case, yes. I found your 
presentation very interesting. And I think you are done with so many good things, and you are giving a good example how fast that science can build up and what next direction it can be taken. Mm, my first question would be if this is done on pigs or identification or just detecting some substances, including hemoglobin from blood cells. Mm. Are you far away from testing in humans? How will this project yeah. evolve in the future? Yeah, so I think, um, you, you know, uh, there are kind of two directions that we're taking the project. Uh, one, of which, one of which is on the, the cell side, and the other which is on the electronic side. So I don't do electronics one, so I'll talk about that first. Essentially, the capsule is quite large. But there's a lot of engineering work that um, the electrical engineers are interested in miniaturizing it further so that it can be something that's, you know, maybe a centimeter by a centimeter form factor instead of the, the one by three centimeter, which is quite large. Um, as well as in increasing the amount of different things you can detect at the same time. So that's on the electronic side. On the biosensing side, I think blood is an interesting proof of concept, but you can imagine that there might be a lot more interesting uh, molecules that you would want to detect that might be associated with disease. And especially in the context of the capsule, since you can detect multiple different molecules at once, having more sensors would kind of give the device more power. So right now we're interested in developing, particularly for markers of inflammation for inflammatory bowel disease. Um, we're also kind of interested for uh, chronic kidney disease as well, or other uh, molecules that are produced in the gut uh, that might be correlated with different disease. Um, some of the problems are that right now, not a lot of clinicians look at the feces for biomarkers, mostly because sampling is hard, no one really wants to work with stool. People would much rather draw blood or do a urine test than look at feces. So there aren't a lot of clinically validated biomarkers looking at stool, and we would like those so that we can put them into the device, but they're hard to measure, so now we're kind of in this chicken the egg situation, uh, how to figure out what molecules would be interesting, uh, interesting and clinically relevant, and how we can feed that into the system. Oh, just from clinical point of view, we have so many patients that they are taking so many different medications. Mm. We call that polypharmacy. Patients are taking more than five medications. Mm. That affects their gastrointestinal environment as mm. well as it affects their kidney or liver function. Yeah. And just thinking about your project, you know, if, if there would be some ability in the future to monitor changes, it's mm. not only to detect but to monitor changes what yeah. is going on due to drug interactions or many other things that they are already in place. I think that gives another kind of yeah. interesting direction, you know, that from clinical side could be high interest. Yeah. And to swallow these capsules, I did something many, many years ago, 30, 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. We used to do these capsules just to monitor ga gastric pH and to monitor how medications affected, you know, pH mm -hmm. mostly through acidity level changes. Yeah. It will, you know, I can see that from clinical side as very useful thing because people can follow many things <laughs> they need yeah. to do that. Yeah. If of course, if computer science has to help with smaller kind of a capsule based on the size, but yeah. I think it's a good way to cope. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And there's, uh, I mean, we're, we're always interested to hear if there are more molecules that would be interesting. Uh, we'd like to develop them. Uh, kind of, there's always a divide between academia and, and the clinic and kind of talking to clinicians is sometimes hard if you're at this institution or at this other institution. So the more ideas that we have, we can see whether we can develop them or not. Um, there's also some other great work um, out of uh, Monash University in Australia uh, with these in this ingestible capsule idea, instead of using living cells, which is you know maybe overly complicated to detect things, they, they created these gas sensors so they can monitor things like oxygen level, things like methane level, things like hydrogen level in the gut, and they're interested in using those. I think, um, as well as pH and temperature and pressure and those sorts of things. So I think the, the more that you can pack into this device, the more data that you can get, I think that would be more important for a lot of these things. Yeah, have a question? Have you ever seen a cloned animal? A cloned animal? <laughs> uh, I, I've seen cloned mice, I guess. Uh, we produced the first cloned animal at UConn. Wow. What was it? Cattle. 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 Yeah, not mice. <laughs> oh, well, we did mice too, but cattle yeah. was the first. First, I think, yeah. <laughs>
They don't look different, that's it, than the dog. Very, very well different. Yeah. We could see a thing. Are there any questions or yeah. what excites you the most about the work? Um what excites me the most about my work? I'd say I just I mean I like the, the, the clinical application of it, the prospect that it can help a lot of different people. I feel like as a lot of scientists, you know, there, there's, uh, or people that are interested in general about clinical applications of things, you can either decide to go the doctor route where you're directly interacting, uh, interacting with people, or you can decide to go this research route, which is definitely the loftier goal where you, know, you imagine that you might create something that might save the world. It's the save the world conference. So that's kind of the driving force for me is like, maybe I can create something that could help a wide of people across the world, people that I don't know, and that could be, uh, you know, extend far beyond what my immediate reach could be. Um, that's in terms of the clinical thing. The simpler thing is I just like puzzles. I've always liked puzzles. Um, so this is an interesting puzzle. I just have a comment. I think your project is very unique in that you combine biology, uh, engineering, and uh, Information technology, mm -hmm. all in one project, and, and most people cannot do that. Right? Yeah. They don't even think that way because they, they don't have the imagination because of the training. Yeah. So that's pretty amazing that you put all these things together. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it was, it was really fun. That was kind of, it started off with uh, our two bosses deciding that they wanted to collaborate, but in no specific way. So Phil and I were put into a room and told to come up with something. <laughs> <laughs> so we came up with that. And they were like, okay. <laughs> Six years later, we got it done. <laughs> yeah. How did you come up with that? Um, I don't know. I just came up with it. I mean, you were just thinking about what would be feasible. And even though this is quite infeasible, I would say, we thought that that was perhaps the lowest bar. Uh, there were a lot of challenges in terms of on the electrical engineering side and kind of getting it low power enough, small enough to fit into a capsule. There were um, challenges that I thought were solvable that Phil did it in terms of you know making these microbes that can sense things and can actually sense things within an animal because especially at the time most of the stuff was all done in vitro and there was this question about whether or not you could use these biosensor organisms in a useful way. And the greatest challenge of all was actually in making the device itself. So not, neither of us had any uh, materials experience. So that taps into your interdisciplinary uh, question. We had like an electrical engineer and a bioengineer, and then the hardest thing was the, the, the materials science or the device manufacturing that we had absolutely no experience in. Um, and again, I guess that speaks to the thing of like, eventually we found a, a a great material scientist that made some suggestions and ended up solving that problem, but we really needed to speak to departments that we don't usually speak to in order to solve that problem and combine everything. Yeah. Um, what inspired you to start the project? Um, when I go to the supermarket, I see the uh, non-GMO verified project on a lot of products you can buy now. And it's something that actually does make like manufacturers a lot of money. What do you think, or like what steps do you think we would need to take in order to make synthetic biology or genetic engineering more appealing to the masses? That's a really good question. Um, I don't think I have a good answer, to be honest. Education. I mean, education, yeah. But sometimes <laughs> education can only get far. I th I'd say rebranding would be a good thing. You would see that um, even though the field of synthetic biology is arguably the same as genetic engineering, I, there was a conscious effort of some of the early founders of the field to rebrand the efforts from genetic engineering into synthetic biology, which is arguably even either a better or worse world, word, but that's besides the point. At least it didn't have kind of the history associated uh, with with GMOs. Um, so I think those sorts of strategies, and again, talking to the public, and also having compelling applications. Maybe, you know, if you're, you're buying as, as a steak in the market, and it's a, or maybe a steak's not the best example, but some vegetables that say that they're genetically modified and you have a choice for something, that might be something that people 
would prefer taking the more natural choice. But if you have something like CAR T cell therapy, where you know you're saying we can save your life with this therapy, and it involves genetically modified organisms, it might be the case where people would be more receptive to that specific application than something like diet. Thanks, everybody.